Hammerlund HQ 100, 1956, 1958. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project available in video and in written form made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is also welcome and appreciated. The models HQ100 and 100A have been relatively cheaper in the larger family of expensive receivers produced by Hammerlund. The HQ100 appeared first, with a single circuit for the Q multiplier and BFO oscillator, while the HQ100A divided those functions so that they could be used simultaneously. The solution of the older model, HQ100, was also adopted by the Japanese Trio 9R59. See also Lafayette HE30 and equivalent receivers. As just mentioned, the HQ100 or 100A was a cheaper model lacking even a fuse and using cheap IEF transformers that by now have developed silver mica disease. The model HQ100 was remarkable also because the movement of the variable capacitor responsible for tuning the antenna was controlled by a cord under the chassis like Phillips did in the early 1940s with the radio model Aachen Super D60. This kind of solution is generally a bad idea, and it was fixed in the model HQ100A. The item under restoration was already serviced, and the big electrolytic capacitor can was disconnected, replacing its function with newer capacitors located under the chassis. There was also an additional connection inserted just before the IF chain, very likely for a panoramic radio spectroscope. The original documentation for this receiver is available from BAMA, Boat Anchor Manual Archive, as well as from other sites. This is the original schematic diagram. After having cleaned the chassis, also treating it with a rust remover in a few bad spots, before proceeding with anything else, it seemed appropriate to include two fuses to protect both power lines against shorts. To avoid ruining a chassis that was still intact, the fuse holders have been inserted in a small plastic box, which took the place of the original electrolytic can already decommissioned. The fuse holders from the box have been linked using small spade connectors. The original power cord with ground connection has been kept, but making sure that it would not move. For this purpose, three grommets have been used. The first one as large as the hole. Two smaller grommets on the wire, one inserted before and one after the hole. The cord end inside the chassis was secured with a cable tie. The external grommet has been pushed towards the cord end, remaining outside the hole. The three grommets have been glued with super glue to themselves, to the power cord, to the chassis. In the end, the cord could not be pulled, pushed, nor turned. C43 and C44 had already been replaced with safety capacitors and therefore they have not been changed. The resistor R20 between the two filter capacitors which was floating around, was secured with the help of a small tag strip. Later, at the end of the restoration, it appeared clear that the power transformer was expressly made for 60 Hz AC, because if attached to European mains with only 50 Hz, through a standard autotransformer, it would vibrate excessively. Three halogen light bulbs have been inserted to drop some voltage, and to control the initial surge of current while turning on the receiver. A small board has been used for installing the halogen light bulb sockets, suspending it over the chassis with the purpose of letting the heat dissipate more easily. 
experimenting with 120 volts light bulbs of different power. In the end, a combination of 325 watts light bulbs in parallel was chosen, making 75 watts in total. Under the circumstances, it was possible to install fuses type fast 100 milliamps, because without the initial current surge, they would not blow until about 800 milliamps. Under the chassis, there is a cord that controls the movement of the antenna variable capacitor. The original cord had been already touched with a soldering iron, and it was appropriate to replace it. Based only on personal preference, there was some experimenting with a thicker type of nylon cord. The purpose was to make it very visible while using a soldering iron in the area in the future. This new type of cord is less elastic, and it loses tension over time. Therefore, it has been necessary to also put back the original tension spring in the variable capacitor pulley. Please notice the slightly different arrangement around the controlling pulley, which was necessary to apply with the new and thicker cord. Before going any further with the description of the restoration, it is important to talk about the tools that will be necessary for the alignment. The original documentation already specifies precisely those tools. Today, instead of General Cement, the company is called GC Electronics, and those tools are still listed in their catalog. The problem is that outside the U.S., it could be difficult or too expensive to buy them. The first tool, the GC5097, necessary for the IF alignment, could be made using the plastic stem of a very small paintbrush. Very likely, while using this homemade tool, its tip would be consumed, and it would be necessary to rework it with a small file. But this is exactly the point. The tool should be less hard than the ferrite core, because the latter is irreplaceable. As for the second tool, the GC8282, it is a completely different business because it has an hexagonal head on a stem that is thinner so that the head can be inserted further to tune another core underneath. And also the quality of the plastic matters because it must be particularly soft and elastic. In other words, there is probably no chance to make it at home. For this restoration, the right equivalent for the function that is needed has been found and used. It is precisely the RS543-147. Please note that this is the side of the tool that should be used later for the RF alignment. With a simple scan around the possible tuned values of the IEF transformer, it has been possible to verify that the IEF chain was aligned way higher than the required 455 kHz. This was consistent with the suspicion that the mica capacitors inside the IEF transformers suffered from silver mica disease and had not been replaced yet. What you see on the oscilloscope screen is an upside-down representation of the bell curve, and the method used for scanning will be described later. The following is a relatively long sequence of clips showing the process of restoration used for the three IF transformers using NP0 capacitors for replacement. The process starts from T7, the last IF transformer, then it continues with T6, the middle one, and it ends with T5, which is the first one.
after checking the condition of the IEF transformer and cleaning it, if that is the case, the rivet at the bottom holding the embedded mica capacitors is carefully cut and then removed. This job requires patience and attention. Now that the rivet is removed, the mica sheets can be extracted. However, first the small metal flaps used to make contact with the mica sheets should be slightly lifted. When the mica sheets have been removed, checking that the metal flaps are not shorting, it is possible to measure the inductance of the two coils. It is necessary to measure the max inductance, corresponding to the ferrite cores completely inserted, like in this clip, but also the minimal inductance, corresponding to the ferrite cores completely extracted. The schematic diagram shows the values that the original mica capacitors should have had. 
However, it is not guaranteed that these supposed values would work well, and it might be difficult to find exactly those values with relatively high insulation voltage and P0 capacitors. In other words, measuring the inductances for all the IF transformers under restoration is necessary to decide what capacitor values to choose. Here you see that it is a good idea to verify that the measured inductances of the two coils do not change if the metal shield is installed. The cores are extracted as much as possible so that the minimal inductance can be measured. While doing the inductance measurement of the IF coils, a table like this one should be populated. Initially with the data on the last IF transformer, then with the calculated capacitances that would fit with the corresponding inductances, then also the chosen capacitor values should be added. And this would continue for all the other IF transformers. By the way, what you just saw is the measurement taken for T6. Before or after the inductance measurements, the original metal flaps are bent, leaving enough space between them for the surface mount and P0 capacitors that are going to be installed. Because the leads connected to these flaps are loose, it is important to tighten them with some super glue. Then, the excesses can be cut.
Some solder is applied to the ends of the trimmed flaps. The surface mount and P0 capacitors of the chosen values are soldered. The IF transformer is then put back in its can, tightened, and then installed on the chassis but only making temporary soldered connections 
because it is necessary to verify that the restored IEF transformer can actually tune comfortably to the expected IEF frequency. To test the IEF transformer and get the initial alignment, a 455 kHz non-modulated signal coming from the signal generator is injected at the input of the preceding tube, like the picture shows, seeking for the most negative voltage measured between pin 1 of the 6AL5 and the chassis ground. If it is possible to peak the output signal without reaching the end on both ferrite core paths, the chosen capacitors are OK, and it is possible to fix the connection with better soldering. Then, it is possible to proceed to the next IEF transformer. Otherwise, if the result is not satisfactory, the IEF transformer should be removed again and one or both capacitors would have to be changed with different values. If the ferrite core has been completely inserted, the corresponding capacitor value should be increased. If the opposite happened, the corresponding capacitor value should be reduced. While populating the table with the measured inductances, also the corresponding capacitances should be calculated to know what is the interval of valid values to choose from. It all starts from the formula which determines the resonance frequency of an LC circuit. Because this formula expects values in Hertz, Henry's and Farad's, an adaptation could be made to make calculations more comfortable with the magnitudes that are actually used. Here are the steps. Then, because the resonance frequency is known and the capacitance is to be calculated instead, the formula is adapted again for the purpose following these steps. Here you see a couple of examples of the actual calculations. The regular IF alignment is done for all the three IF transformers, injecting a non-modulated signal of 455 kHz at pin 7 of V2, 6B6. The negative voltage at the end of the noise limiter diode and the chassis ground pin 1 of the 6AL5 is measured with a voltmeter to obtain the most negative value. The intensity of the 455 kHz signal is kept to a minimum value just enough to be able to do the alignment to avoid overloading the system. However, the receiver is configured for receiving with about 75% sensitivity. Manual volume control. Frequency range 0 0.54, 1.6. Noise limiter off. Audio gain at zero. Selectivity BFO. Main tuning 0 0.54 megahertz. Band spread 100. The IF transformers are aligned accessing above and under the chassis. The cores accessible from above the chassis are related to the secondary windings. Those accessible under the chassis correspond to the primary. It is possible to obtain a visual representation of the quality of the alignment, also with cheap digital equipment, using an unmodulated, slowly sweeping signal around the value of 455 kHz, visualizing the DC negative voltage at the output of the noise limiter diode on a digital oscilloscope with a slow horizontal scan. The bell curve would appear upside down because the IEF transformers would be peaked in correspondence of the most negative value read by the oscilloscope. However, while trying this method before connecting the oscilloscope probe, one should verify first that the voltage corresponds to what is expected. In other words, if the oscilloscope probe is connected to another point with high voltage, the oscilloscope could be destroyed. There are two rotating dials on this receiver, one for the tuning variable capacitor and the other one for the band spread. The shafts connected to the external knobs transfer the movement to the dials, which rotate the shafts of the respective variable capacitors. In the upper part of the front panel, 
there are also some plastic washers used to keep these dial wheels correctly aligned vertically in front of the respective dial glasses. The removal and reinstallation of the front panel requires attention to the correct insertion of the dial wheels in the upper side. While removing or reinstalling the front panel, one should keep in mind that the two lever switches should be released or fixed on the panel operating from the internal nut, while the external ring should be rotated only using fingers. This short clip should be self-explanatory. When the receiver is set to activate the Q multiplier, V4A corresponding to one tried of the 12AX7 is connected to the B plus and to the output of V2 corresponding to a 6BE6. Then, the potentiometer R13 is used to change the bias on the grid. There is a point in which V4A starts oscillating following the frequency that is received from the grid but according to the resonation point tuned with the variable inductor L5, reaching just before that point of oscillation makes the effect of amplifying the signal also improving the selectivity. When the receiver is set to use the BFO oscillator, the switch that connects the grid of V4A is open and the potentiometer R13 is shorted. Therefore, the cathode resistor for V4A is reduced to 6.8 kilo ohms where the circuit should start oscillating at about 455 kHz, tuning it with the variable inductor L5. The signal generated by the BFO oscillator is still loosely coupled, even though the switch is open. If the switch were closed instead, the signal received by the first IF transformer would be overwhelmingly strong and useless. There is an enclosed area containing the variable inductor L5 and a few other components. It is easily accessible, but that should not be necessary. For the model HQ100, the alignment of the Q multiplier corresponds to the alignment of the BFO oscillator, and it is easier to obtain for the latter. The purpose is to get the BFO oscillating exactly at 455 kHz when the frequency knob is pointing up, and to allow an equal degree of rotation counterclockwise and clockwise. There is a stop log attached to the panel bushing nut, where a long screw inserted on a ring on the shaft would hit and stop the movement of it. The ring can be released by unscrewing the long screw, and the other short screw that is in place. Initially, this should be done to allow the free rotation of the L5 shaft. Then, it is necessary to find the right tuning of L5. This is done activating the Q multiplier and BFO circuit, injecting the same 455 kHz unmodulated signal that was required for the IF alignment while listening to the beating effect on the loudspeaker.
when the beating frequency is zero, in other words, when it is so low to be non-audible, that is the place where the knob should indicate the upper position. Finally, the ring on the L5 shaft should be adjusted and fixed again so that the long screw would hit on the stop log when the movement of the knob is even in both directions. At this point of the overall alignment procedure, it is also appropriate to take care of the signal meter indicator. First of all, it should be mechanically zeroed. Then, according to the original documentation, with the AVC activated, the sensitivity at the maximum level, pin 1 of V5 grounded and no signal input, the potentiometer R15 at the rear of the chassis should be adjusted to obtain a zero value on the meter. However, if the cabinet is already installed, without shorting to ground pin 1 of V5, it is possible to just short the antenna input. The result might not give the same accuracy. This way, it is much easier to do. This receiver has three stages in the RF section, the antenna, the RF preamplifier, and the oscillator. However, the lower frequency band has no RF preamplifier, the alignment starts from the lower frequency band and progresses up to the higher frequency. The coils are accessible completely from above the chassis, but in the RF preamplifier and in the oscillator sections, there are two ferrite cores in each can, therefore a special tool is necessary for the alignment, as described at the beginning of this video. For the model HQ100, all the trimmer capacitors are accessible from under the chassis. The detailed procedure is described in the original documentation, but is also available in the written documentation that comes along with this video. In short, it is verified that the dial wheels can travel the entire extension of their scale. Otherwise, their orientation should be adjusted in relationship to the respective variable capacitor shaft. The antenna terminal A2 is shorted with the ground terminal. Then the receiver is set like in the picture, where the band spread indicator is aligned to 100 on the log scale. The required signal is loosely coupled with the antenna input and the intensity of the signal is regulated keeping it as low as possible. The signal can be non-modulated, but if it is modulated it can be heard from the loudspeaker, making the procedure slightly easier. Except for one case, all the adjustments are done seeking for the most negative voltage measured between pin 1 of the 6 AL5 and the chassis ground. If possible, it is important to verify that the actual oscillator frequency is above the signal that is used for the alignment. Here you can see the whole RF alignment 10 times faster. What takes a lot of time is the continuous need to change the frequency on the signal generator and on the receiver dial.
the cabinet of the item under restoration appeared in relatively good condition, except for some signs of corrosion. The cabinet seems like a basket made of an iron net, and probably it is not suitable for cleaning it with a sandblaster. Anyhow, a sandblaster would not have been available for the restoration, and the iron cabinet has been submerged in vinegar for some days, until the rust was dissolved and the old paint became soft and started to detach. Then, the cabinet has been brushed and resubmerged in vinegar various times along more days to make sure that all the residues of paint were completely removed. Finally, it was cleaned and washed with soap to remove the residues of acid. Unfortunately, this process also removes the zinc coating if there is any. So once the metal parts are taken out of the soapy water, they must be dried very fast and painted immediately. A first coat of zinc paint has been applied, then the final paint on top of it. Also the tube shields have been treated with a rust remover and then painted. They had been treated already before the alignment procedure. While cleaning it, also the chassis had been treated with a gel rust remover, which left some dark but harmless stripes, and no attempt has been made to hide them with paint. The front panel of the item under restoration appeared in decent condition, except for some brown stains. It seemed a good idea to try washing it in the dishwasher, but then the writings were ruined while the brown stains were still there. So, the panel has been stripped using acetone. In fact, the front panel is made of cast aluminum, which is not suitable for soaking in vinegar. Then, it has been painted with the same acrylic color used for the perforated cabinet, renouncing to try to replicate the original colors. The original writings have been rewritten, in the hope of reproducing them using water slide decals. The file that was prepared is available in the written documentation that comes along with this video. But printing using a white ink can be a challenging task. One could find a printing service that can actually do that, but that would result in being expensive. So first an attempt has been made with a yellow gold color to make a test. Just because of personal preferences, the water slide decals plan has been abandoned in favor of old style 3D labels. Initially with a clumsy attempt. Later a plan has been prepared to get a symmetric result. This was the final choice for the restoration. If in the future it will not appear satisfactory, the front panel could be redone without extra complications. On the back panel together with the 3D labels, also some information has been added for safety. Here is the collection of replaced parts. The screws found in this unit were generally of type UNC, only the S-meter used metric screws. The Hammerlund HQ100 is ready.
The test starts from the lower frequency band and proceeds up, ending to 30 MHz. The test is done only with an indoor antenna 
but in the 40 meter band, 7 megahertz, it is possible to listen to some ham radio communication. Perhaps even conflict and, and so on. So, come back. I'm going to find out. I'm searching for it. I can't watch it. 
The last position of the band switch selector 20BS is only a variant of the band 1030 MHz, especially dedicated to the 14 MHz 20 meters. But for this position of the band switch selector, there is no specific alignment. If you would like to contribute to this project, donating old electronics equipment or old radios in whatever condition they might be, provided that you do not feel any attachment that could be helpful for my next restoration documentation and video production.